Each summer, the younger family from the Detroit, Michigan area would take an annual vacation to a quiet town in northern Michigan, or up north, as Detroiters like to say. Their 2003 vacation would turn out to be their last, however, as 37-year-old mom Florence Unger went missing while on that vacation and was never seen alive again. From the south shore of Lake Erie, this is Great Lakes True Crime. Born in Detroit on March 16, 1966, Florence Gabrielle was adopted by Claire Stern and her husband, Harold, a successful attorney. Florence, who was known as Flo to friends, enjoyed hiking, horseback riding, and interior design, according to the Detroit Jewish News. She had an eye for beauty and was the last person you'd want to be with at a flea market, her older cousin Elizabeth Stern told the newspaper. Friends and relatives of Florence said she had a zest for life and an eye for beauty, including the ability to see the beauty in every person she came across. She had worked as a loan officer at Flagstar Bank and was active in her community. Florence would sometimes volunteer as a mystery reader at her children's school, where she would come in and surprise the students by reading a story to them. As a testament to her popularity in her hometown of Huntington Woods, Flo's funeral was attended by over 700 mourners. Mark Stephen Unger came into the world on November 29, 1960. He grew up in the affluent town of Huntington Woods, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit just north of the city in Oakland County. Mark's mother, Betty Rosenthal, owned several successful restaurants in the Florida Keys, which allowed Mark to live a charmed life growing up. As a student at the private Detroit Country Day School, Mark was very athletic. He was on the football and swim teams, and he advanced to the Michigan State Championships as a tennis player in his 11th and 12th grade years. After graduating from the University of Michigan, Mark found employment as an advertisement copywriter, a restaurant manager, and a bartender, but he eventually landed his dream job, a radio sportscaster on a Detroit radio station. The job didn't pay well, but it was a job he truly loved. Mark met Florence while both were college students, with Florence majoring in fine arts at Michigan. After two years of dating, Mark proposed by hiding an engagement ring in an ice cream sundae. They got married on February 24, 1990. Once the couple started a family, Florence chose to stay at home and raise the children, leaving Mark the sole income earner in the household. With his dream radio job not paying a whole lot, Mark picked up a second job at the Michigan Jewish Sports Hall of Fame but he ultimately had to step down from his cherished sportscaster job for a better-paying career as a mortgage banker. Friends of the Youngers knew them to be a happy couple. Florence was charming and was said to have movie star good looks. On the surface, it seemed like Mark and Florence were living the dream with a happy marriage, two kids, and a spacious home in an upscale suburb. But by 1998, eight years after they were married, Mark became addicted to painkillers after back surgery for an old sports injury. He developed a drinking problem on top of that. In 1999, three casinos opened in Detroit, Michigan, and Mark developed a gambling addiction on top of his drug and alcohol dependency, with the MGM Grand reportedly being his casino of choice. On top of these issues, the couple struggled to make the payments from their big house in the fancy suburb According to various sources, the Younger's 33-square-foot home in Huntington Woods had at least four bedrooms and three bathrooms. 
Mark did realize that he needed help, though. His father had been a heavy drinker who went off on benders, and Mark did not want to follow in his dad's footsteps. So he checked into a residential rehab facility in late 2002 and spent about a total of five months there. After he completed his treatment, Mark did not go back to his mortgage banker job. It's not clear if he quit or if he was let go by the company, but in any case, Mark found himself unemployed. Not surprisingly, the family struggled without Mark's income, on top of the expenses he paid for rehab and his gambling losses. So Florence took a job as a loan officer at Flagstar Bank. By this time, the marriage was on very shaky ground. On top of Mark's addiction issues, he had apparently let himself go physically and began to let down the family by missing important school events for the kids and by frequently turning angry and hostile at home. Florence, at the age of 37, had decided that their marriage was over and she began an affair with a man named Glenn Stark who happened to be a good friend of Mark's. Florence filed for divorce in August 2003, but Mark was uncooperative and refused to sign the divorce papers. Florence and her lawyer had irritated Mark by demanding to know the full extent of his gambling losses and the total amount of money he spent on his extensive rehab stays. Mark had no interest in a divorce. He insisted that he still loved Florence and pushed to take her, their 10-year-old son Max, and 7-year-old son Tyler, on their annual family vacation to northern Michigan. Florence had no desire to go on the trip with Mark, but she eventually relented and agreed to go. So in late October of 2003, the younger family went on their trip to Arcadia, a small resort town just off of Lake Michigan. They stayed at a resort called the Watervale Inn, which was a 1920s era resort on Lower Herring Lake. The first night there, Florence and Mark were sitting on a deck attached to a neighboring resort's boathouse. Around 9 p.m., a fisherman docked his small boat and spoke to Florence. By this time, it was very dark out, and the fisherman said that Florence told him she was afraid of the dark. According to Mark, he walked back to the couple's rented cottage, which was about 100 yards from the boathouse, at 9.30 p.m. to put Max and Tyler to bed. Then he said he returned to the deck and discovered Florence was missing. He said he saw some lights on at the neighbor's cottage, so he guessed that she may have gone over there to visit. So then Mark said he supposedly went back to the cottage, watched a movie, and fell asleep. When he woke up the next morning and Florence wasn't there, he called the resort owners to ask if she had seen Florence. The resort owner later said that Mark said he was going to check around the inn to see if she had taken another room. He didn't explain that, but he indicated that she might be suicidal. That same resort owner would later find Florence Unger's body floating in the water down at the lake. When she went to the cottage to break the news to Mark that she and her husband found Florence's lifeless body, Mark went ballistic. She said he started crying and screaming and hollering, and he went directly down to the lake to the exact spot where her body was located. The resort owners found this quite peculiar, though, as they hadn't told Mark where they found her, and her body wasn't visible from their location, so how did he know exactly where to go? That seems pretty strange. Police noticed that a deck railing on the boat dock was broken and leaning in the water, which led to speculation that perhaps she was sitting on the railing when it gave away, thrusting Florence into the water. This seemed plausible, as the railing was in a state of disrepair. In fact, it was in such poor condition that locals apparently referred to it as a death trap. No drugs or alcohol were found in Florence's system, and her death was initially viewed as a simple, yet unfortunate, accidental drowning. That theory quickly changed, however, when police found a very faint but large area of blood on the dock. This led to a question as to whether this was Florence's blood, and if so, whether she was harmed prior to entering the water. Police had actually been suspicious of Mark from the time they got there. 
On the roof deck, they noticed that a portion of the railing was broken, and the blood stain that they found on the dock happened to be 12 feet directly below the broken railing. Next up, the police searched Mark's SUV and found a pair of his shoes smeared with white paint that turned out to be very similar to the paint on the deck railing. And what's more, by the time investigators first arrived at the scene, Mark had already packed up the family's Ford Expedition SUV and was about to head home with his two sons. This obviously seemed like odd behavior. If your wife tragically dies, you have no real answers, and yet you're ready to leave the area and head home as if it was case closed on her? After being confronted by police with this information, Mark hired his own private forensic investigators who tried to suggest that Florence must have sat on the railing, it broke, she fell down onto the concrete deck, and then rolled into the water and drowned. No one really bought into that theory, though. The medical examiner replied with a simple statement, quote, bodies don't bounce, unquote. Investigators looked into how much force it would take to bust through that railing. They applied 200 pounds of pressure to a section of the rail and found that it did not break. While this doesn't seem to take into account all the variables that could factor into a railing busting loose, police were convinced that the accident scene had been staged. Police theorized that perhaps Florence and Mark got into a fight that night over her refusal to reconcile with him, and then maybe Mark blew up on her and threw his wife over the railing, later kicking in some wooden slats to make it look like an accidental fall. Maybe the rejection stoked some old angers and feelings about having to give up that beloved sportscaster job, or frustrations over his weight gain, or just the stress of not being able to use the drugs or alcohol that he had been addicted to. The police theory, based on forensic analysis, also included speculation that after about 90 minutes which was long enough for the pool of blood to form on the concrete, Mike checked on Florence and discovered she was still breathing, so he pushed her body three feet from its location into the water. Mark stood to gain financially from Florence's death. He had two life insurance policies for a total of $750,000 on his wife. But people who knew Mark argued that he loved this family and there's nothing he would do to hurt them. He had no criminal history. Nobody in the area heard anything strange the night of Florence's death. Mark maintained his innocence all along. In May 2004, seven months after Florence's death, Mark was charged with murder. Max and Tyler went to live with their maternal grandparents. And in the run-up to Mark's trial, a circuit court judge in Oakland County, Michigan, declined a request by Mark to have the boys return to his custody from the grandparents. Mark's murder trial finally began in 2006 in Benzie County, Michigan Circuit Court. During the trial, Mark's defense team suggested that Florence may have had a seizure that propelled her from the cement into the water. They also showed an animated rendering of how she could have fallen and then tumbled into the water. The defense went on to note that the boathouse railing was too low to meet building code requirements, and they suggested that that may have contributed to Florence's, quote, accidental fall. For their part, prosecutors accused the defense team of trying to portray Florence as a shopping-crazed adulteress after Glenn Stark, who had moved to Montana by the time of the trial, testified. Glenn acknowledged that he and Florence exchanged romantic emails for two years and had sexual relations on four separate occasions, one of which was just a week before her death. Mark claimed that he didn't know about the affair until after Florence died, and Glenn seemed to corroborate that claim by calling the affair the, quote, best-kept secret in Huntington Woods. Jurors deliberated for 26 hours over a period of four days before releasing their verdict. Mark Unger was found guilty of first-degree murder. 
Although Mark's attorney said the decision stunned him and his client, Mark showed almost no emotion as he was handcuffed and taken away from the courtroom. Mark's mother expressed disbelief. My son is innocent, she said. He would never hurt anyone. I think the world knows that, except those people. In 2006, Max and Tyler won a $10 million lawsuit against their father for their mother's projected lifetime earnings as a bank loan officer and the personal loss to her survivors. It's not very likely that Mark had enough money to pay off a settlement of that size, but the son's lawyers also pursued claims on property and insurance. In 2019, Mark lost a bid for a new trial on the basis of ineffective counsel. He argued that his lawyer didn't object to provocative comments in the courtroom. Mark is presently offender number 611081 in the Chippewa Correctional Facility in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Florence is buried at Clover Hill Park Cemetery, which, according to the Detroit Jewish News, is known as the final resting place of Metro Detroit's most prominent Jewish figures. Although she never got to fulfill all of her own promise, it looks as though her sons are on track to realize their potential. Max and Tyler both have successful careers of their own, and by all accounts are doing quite well. And that's all for this episode of Great Lakes True Crime, although I do have one streaming recommendation for you. I recently was able to watch The Weekend Away, which is a film rather than a series. The plot involves two British women taking a weekend trip to Croatia, and only one of them makes it home alive. It's a bit of a thriller as well as a crime drama. The Weekend Away is not a remarkable film, and it doesn't have a great score on the tomato meter, but I think it's worth watching. It was entertaining. You can find it streaming on Netflix. It's called The Weekend Away. A big thank you to the show supporters who bought me a virtual cup of coffee through the website at podpage.com slash Great Lakes True Crime. And also many thanks to those of you who recently left five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and several other podcast apps. If you haven't left a five-star review, I could really use your help with that, so please do so if you have the time and inclination. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Great Lakes True Crime. You can also check out links in the show notes for our social media handles, the web address, and the show merchandise page. This has been Steve, your host and producer. Thanks for listening, guys.